Sky Jathani is a pastor, current author, um, conference speaker, and is much in demand as a commentator. He hosts a regular a TV, or a regular blog, rather, on the internet, and uh, has written a book entitled the, the Divine Commodity. The essence of the book is summarized with this particular statement that you see on the screen in front of you. Consumer Christianity, while promising to strengthen our souls with, a, with an entertaining faith, has left us malnourished with an anemic view of God, faith, church, and mission. He has spoken critically of some of the kinds of things that churches have been doing in recent days. And if you're interested in pursuing that, there's a series of uh, YouTube videos. If you Google his name, you can find them. Very interesting. As he talks about some of the trends that are taking place in our world today. One of the things that's been observed by many is uh, a kind of spiritual anemia that is part of the Christian church in America today. And the issue that's raised is how, how do we deal with a spiritual anemia? Maybe you've struggled with it yourself. Maybe you felt like, is this all there is? Maybe you felt at times like, there seems to be more when I read the pages of the New Testament, when I think about or read about what Jesus and the disciples did and the early church and so forth. Is there more? And this morning, as we continue in our study of Moses, I think Moses directs our hearts in, in that uh, direction as he encourages us with a pursuit of God. It has to do more with, with the relationship of the individual and our personal pursuit than it does with the mechanics of what's going on around us. So three things that I would suggest to you from our study of Moses as we look at the portions of Scripture in front of us in, in actually chapters 32, 33, and 34 in the book of Exodus is first, Moses encourages us to seek God's favor to seek his favor. To take us back to where we were in the book of Exodus, you'll remember that the nation of Israel was brought out of Egypt by God and invested with a brand new covenant called the Mosaic Covenant. They came from Egypt. They had crossed over the Red Sea down into the Sinai Peninsula. It has taken them two months for them to arrive at this place in Mount Sinai where God had intended that he would enter into a relationship with them. And so he brought them to this location away from Egypt, away from the life that they had known, in order that he might enter into a new relationship. And that new relationship is the covenant which God offered to Israel there at Mount Sinai. We call it the Mosaic Covenant. It was the relationship between God and the nation of Israel that was exercised through Moses. What happened, however, is that within a matter of days, that covenant was broken. And we last left our study here looking at those events in Exodus chapter 32, when the nation of Israel, uh, fearing Moses' absence and not knowing what had happened to him, constructed this golden calf and began to worship the calf. Aaron said to them, this calf is your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And they began to worship him. And Moses, as he eventually returns and comes upon the scene, recognizes that the nation of Israel is out of control in their uh, response and in their worship of this golden calf. You know the story. As he came down from the mountain, observed the scene, he threw the two tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written and broke them there at the foot of the mountain, symbolizing the fact that this covenant was broken, that this relationship which the nation of Israel had voluntarily embraced was broken by their behavior. 
And so as we move along now in Exodus 32, 3 and 4, Moses pursues a restoration for the nation of Israel. And it starts with his own relationship with God, and it moves beyond what he is doing for the nation of Israel. He goes up on the mountain, he says, to make atonement for them. In verse 30 of Exodus 32, we read, On the next day, Moses said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin. Now I'm going up to the Lord, up on Mount Sinai. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Atonement is the word to cover. It means to, it means to take care of the business that has been affected by their sin. And so he's going up on the mountain to make things right with God once again. And he says, uh, as he continues, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin. But now, if you will, forgive them. Sin inhibits a relationship with God. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, right? That when you and I sin we break that relationship. Same thing happens in human relationships. You have a relationship with a spouse or with a friend, with a coworker, and when you sin against that person, you break that relationship. It doesn't destroy the relationship. The marriage isn't destroyed. The, the family relationship isn't destroyed. It's not necessarily that you lose your job over it, but you're not working together. You're not pulling together as we ought. And so that relationship is broken. Sin inhibits relationship. And that's true for the nation of Israel here in the Old Testament. They're in a covenant relationship with God, and their sin has placed the workings of that relationship in jeopardy. And Moses wants to deal with that. It's the same for you and me. We have accepted Jesus as our personal Savior. Probably most of us here can give testimony to that. But sin inhibits that relationship. According to the book of 1 John, if we walk in darkness, we do not have fellowship with God who is light. And so the relationship that we have with him is inhibited by that sin. And so that sin has to be confessed, and that's what Moses does. He goes up on the mountain, and he places himself before God, and he says, we have committed a great sin. Please forgive us if you will forgive their sin. And he even offers himself on behalf of the people, saying, if you will not, then please blot me out of your book. I don't know all that that means. There are a lot of different interpretations there. Most likely it has to do with simply the records that God keeps in terms of uh, relationships. And so Moses is concerned about that for the nation of Israel. God responds to him. The Lord says to him, whoever sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But go now, lead this people where I told you. And so God accepts Moses' intervention his intercession for the people and he agrees that that he will continue to carry out what he has promised for them go now lead this people where i told you but my angel will go before you nevertheless in the day when i punish i will punish those who uh who have sinned what's interesting to me is in the process moses says a few verses later in the next chapter looking back on this he says, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself will not let me know when you will send with me. Moreover, he says, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have found favor in my sight. So Moses, as he intercedes for the people here, as he confesses their sin, has found favor with God. Favor is grace. It's God's grace. And when you and I, in a like manner, come before the Lord in confession of the sin that we have exercised, we find grace. We find favor with the Lord. That's what Moses is seeking. Now, sometimes people say, well, that was in the old covenant. Under the new covenant, we don't have to worry about any of those things. Uh, that's not true. 
if I read the book of Hebrews correctly, which deals with issues under the new covenant, the writer to the Hebrews here says, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? What does he mean, trampled underfoot the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? What he's talking about is rejecting what Jesus has done, turning away from what Jesus has done for us, and rejecting this sacrifice which Jesus has made for our sin. We do that by our sin in rejection of what God has asked us to do. He says, and as a result has insulted the spirit of grace. I don't know if you think of it that way, but when you and I sin, Hebrews is saying we insult the Spirit of God who lives within us. The very Spirit of grace is insulted by our behavior. Have you ever been insulted by what somebody said or did to you? Of course. And so the Spirit of God who lives within us is insulted when you and I do things contrary to the holiness of God, contrary to obedience in God's word. The writer goes on to say, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's new covenant. That's New Testament truth. That it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. <laughs> excuse me, to fall in the hands of a living God means <clears throat> that we come under his chastening because of sin in our lives. And so it's important for us to recognize when that occurs and to deal with that. Here's the solution under the new covenant. It's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, sometimes people get a little confused about confession of sins and sin. A confession of sin is the acknowledgement of our sinful nature and condition, which has to happen for you and me to be born again. And so an individual has to come to a recognition that he or she has violated God's standards and is disqualified and is outside of God, and acknowledge that in order to be born again. It's to say to God, I know I'm a sinful person. We don't do that once we're born again into God's family. If you've never been born again, then you have to do that. That's where it has to start. But being born again into God's family, we practice what is called confession of sins. See, John says, if we confess our sins He's talking here about individual acts of disobedience and or rebellion. He's talking about the things that we do now that we're part of God's family, now that we are indwelt by the Spirit of God, now that we are in a relationship with God as our Heavenly Father, we do things that are disobedient and or rebellious, and that needs to be confessed. That's seeking God's favor, seeking God's grace. It's going before God and saying to God, God, I know that I have offended you. I've offended you by doing such and such. I've offended you by deliberately disobeying what you have said in your word or what you want us to do. I am set my life on a course of action that is directly contrary to what your word says. And I agree with God about that behavior. Whether it's lying or stealing or cheating or insulting or whatever it is, it's a matter of agreeing with God about that. That confession enables us then to pursue God's favor. And that's what Moses did in step one. Step two is to seek God's presence, is to go beyond simply pursuing the forgiveness that's necessary for the working relationship on a daily basis to now pursuing the very presence of God. And so um, what we have is God offering Moses at this point to send an angel before the nation of Israel. 
the Lord says to Moses, depart from here, you and the people that you've brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, Perizzite, Hittite, Termites, and all the others that are there. What is not said and what appears to be an issue is that the tabernacle has been placed on hold. You have to remember the segments of the book of Exodus. It was in Exodus chapter 24 that Moses went up on the mountain and he spends the 40 days and 40 nights the first time. In Exodus 25, God begins to give Moses the instructions for building the tabernacle. And that's what's going on up on the mountain while the nation of Israel ultimately is constructing the golden calf and breaking the covenant. So now God says, okay, I have forgiven. I have, I have, I have accepted your intercession, and I have forgiven the nation for this but I'm not going to be in your midst. The whole purpose of the tabernacle in 25.8 is that I may dwell in the midst of my people. God's desire was that he would be right in the presence by dwelling in that tabernacle. So it may be that the tabernacle here is placed on hold. Secondly, what we find is that God says, I will keep my promises. And so that's true for the nation of Israel, it's true for us as well. God is faithful even if we deny him. Even if we're unfaithful, he's faithful, and so he will keep his promises. So he says to Moses, I I will drive out the inhabitants of the land. I will give the land, but it appears that God is going to keep his distance. And that's something that Moses becomes very concerned about. God says, You go up, I'll send an angel before you, but I'm not going to walk in your midst because you are an obstinate people and I might destroy you on the way. If I'm living in your midst and you pull this kind of a stunt, I may destroy you. He goes on to point out he's a jealous God. And he hates it when we worship false gods. And it seems to me that this is possible today as well. That the Spirit of God takes up residence within us, and God will keep his promises for us. But if we we don't pursue God, that he may stand back from us. This is what we've done in our schools, in our government. We've asked God to leave. And being the gentleman that he is, he's left. It's not that he's not there. It's not that he doesn't know what's going on. It's not that he's no longer omnipresent. It's that he chooses not to be engaged in those areas. And if you and I are not pursuing God, then it may be that he's standing at arm's length with us as well. Um, Moses is not happy with this, and he pursues the presence of God. The Bible tells us here in Exodus 33 that the nation of Israel went into mourning. When they heard that, they were really sad. They took off all their earrings and their jewelry and everything else, and they were really sad. Moses was not just sad. Moses went into the tent of meeting at this point. And we have this, this report. It says, Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which is outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, <coughs> excuse me, the people would arise and stand, each one at a distance, at, at, each at the entrance of his tent, and gaze after Moses as he entered the tent. And so Moses now pursues a relationship with the Lord because he doesn't want. He, he doesn't want to take the people with an angel. He wants the Lord to be in their presence. And so we read, whenever Moses entered the tent, God would come and stand at the doorway of the tent, and that's where he is now. Right? Previously, he was up on the mountain. He comes back, and he reports to the people, and now, as they mourn, he goes into the tent at this point. And what we find 
is that Moses insists on God's presence with the people. He says, now therefore, I pray you, if I found favor in your sight, and that's what he's already done, found favor. He found favor by confessing the sin of Israel. He says, let me know your ways that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. <clears throat> so the favor must be growing in some way. And he says, <clears throat> consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. And then he says, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead me up from here. If your presence doesn't go with us, do not lead me up from here. Moses insists on God's presence and provides the model for us to insist on God's presence as well. He says, as he continues, for how can it be known that this is your people if you're not present? If God is not present in our lives, how will people know that we are genuine followers of the Lord? Um, God delights in this pursuit by Moses. As Moses says to him, Lord, we don't want to move without you. God is delighted with that. And he responds. And he says, I will go with you. Um, David has a similar experience in the Psalms. We read in Psalm 27, um, one thing, David says, I will ask of the, so of the Lord. One thing I will seek. That is, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. And so as he speaks these words, David is responding. Thank you, Greg, I appreciate that. <clears throat> as he speaks these words, <clears throat> David is pursuing God. And a couple of verses later, God speaks to him. And what God says to him is, seek my face. And so David responds in verse 8, same psalm. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. And so David pursues the face of God. To pursue the face of God is to pursue the presence of God. The word face means to stand in the presence of or to stand before. And so face and presence are essentially the same thing in the New in the Old Testament wording. And that's what David is doing <clears throat> as he comes into the temple to seek the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, I shared with you some, a quote from John Piper. You may recognize his picture here. And I shared with you something that I thought he had missed as we talked about our understanding of the covenants and the dispensations and so forth. Today, I want to share with you what John Piper got right and he gets a lot right. He is an amazing man of God. And one thing that has sort of, sort of characterized his ministry is this statement, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. He's touching the heartbeat of genuine Christianity. He's dealing with this issue of spiritual anemia, when he says it's not the issue of what happens at the church, it's the issue of what happens with me. It's the issue of whether I am satisfied with God or not. And so I appreciate the emphasis that he brings in this area. And if you want to read things by him, uh, you do yourself very well. Here's the bottom line. Joy is not the absence of suffering, but rather the presence of of God. It's the presence of God. But here, here's the conundrum, if you will, or the paradox of our dispensation. The paradox of our dispensation is, is that we have God present in us, but we're often not in his presence. Say, wait a minute, how can that be? 
How can it be that God can be present in us, but we're not in his presence? And the answer is, well, let me give you an analogy first. A few days ago, you all know about the Final Four and basketball, collegiate basketball and so forth, and how important it is to watch these games um, as we were moving toward that and toward Villanova's uh, ending up number one and so forth. Well, one of the days the game was on TV and Fran was trying to talk to me. And that doesn't work very well. Whatever she was saying was not important, right? Actually, it probably was very important, but I'm absorbed with the game on TV. And so I was present with her, but I was not in her presence. See how it works? We've done that. You've done that with people, right? You've been in a conversation with somebody, and the person's talking to you, and they're looking at the clock. They're, um, you know, looking at the watch. Their, their eyes are other places, and you realize rather quickly that this person is not really engaged in the conversation with me. The same thing is true with us. We have the Spirit of God within us, but we're often not in the Spirit. We are often living in a way that is disconnected from God who actually lives within us. And that's the paradox. That's the, that's the thing which just doesn't compute. Is that we have the very presence of God within us, and yet we live as though he were not there at all. And that's when God does this distance thing. Somehow he's there but not there. A writer from a previous um, age, Dr. A.W. Tozer, and anything you find by Tozer, you should grab hold of it and read it and reread it. He says this, the presence of God is the central fact of Christianity. At the heart of the Christian message is God himself waiting for his redeemed children to push in to conscious awareness of his presence. Present-day Christianity knows this presence only in theory. It fails to stress the Christian's privilege of present realization. According to the teachings, we are in the presence of God positionally. And that's true. We are in the presence of God positionally. And nothing is said about the need to experience his, that presence actually. The fiery urge that drove men like uh, McShaney and others um, is wholly missing. Ignoble contentment takes the place of burning zeal. We are satisfied to rest in our judicial possessions, that is, what God has granted to us by his authoritative word, by our judicial uh, possessions, but we, um, for the most part, do not bother ourselves about the absence of his personal experience. We forget about the fact that God is a person who wants to have a personal relationship with us. And we're settling for the gift of eternal life that has been granted. And we're, at, we're living like spoiled children. Are we not? When that's the occasion. Third thing, very quickly, seek God's glory. To take it a step beyond that. To seek his favor, that means I seek his grace when I have sinned against him. I seek his presence in that I want to live in his presence. I want to live in a way that I am aware of the presence of the Spirit of God who lives within me and of the Holy Creator God who desires to have a relationship with me. And then Moses says, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to see God's glory. And so the Lord continues in this conversation. He says, the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing of which you have spoken. I will go up with you. For you have found favor in my sight, and I've known you by name. Moses says, then I pray, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Moses wants more of God. Do you want more of God? That's why he created us. That's what he wants for us. God initiates the process, but you and I must pursue it. 
God is the one who starts this, but it has to happen because you and I want to take it over and pursue and walk with him. Um, Moses says, show me your glory. And Tozer says, the impulse to pursue God comes from God. It's initiated by him. But the outworking of that impulse is our following hard after him. It's up to the people who want God. In another place, Tozer said, every single Christian has as much of God as he wants. Every single Christian has as much of God as he wants. Because God delights in those who pursue him, and if you pursue him, he manifests himself. What's interesting is that Moses was expecting that God would maybe show him the glory that he had seen with the elders on the mountain, or the glory that's revealed to us, for example, in the book of Revelation. That wasn't what God was interested in. Interesting, you read the response. I don't have time to go into all this morning, but God says, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. I will forgive whom I forgive. And I will visit the sins of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. What does God talk about? Not what he looks like, but how he acts. It's his character that he reveals to Moses. But he also shows Moses his glory. He says, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, compassion on whom I will show compassion, and so on. But you cannot see my face and live. No mortal can look upon the face of God. We can't stand it. It would be too much. It destroys us if that happens. But God makes a way. You can't do this, but I will make a way for you to be exposed to my glory. And so he goes on to say, there's a place near me, and I'm going to put you there on the rock, and I will cover you over with my hand in the cleft of the rock, and I will pass by. And after I have passed by, he says, I will take my hand away, and you will see my back. But my face you cannot see. But my face you cannot see. And so God is going to give Moses a glimpse of his glory. And perhaps you know the outcome of the story. What we find is that when Moses comes down from the mountain after this experience with God, we find that Moses' face was shining. It was glowing like he had a bad sunburn, but he didn't know it. And when the people of the nation of Israel saw him, they fled from him. They were afraid to come near him because the the face was glowing with the glory of God. And what what was happening is that Moses saw the glory on the mountain, but it continued. He continued to pursue that. It's the kind of thing that you, it's not a once and done thing. What we read in the text of the New Testament is that whenever Moses would go into the tent and he would commune with God, he would come out and his face would be glowing. He would talk with the people and they would see this glow in his face. And then he covered his face with a veil. And so he would, he would wear this veil for whatever number of days until he went into the tent again. And when he went into the tent again, he would remove the veil. And then he would come out and his face would be glowing like it was before. And he would speak to the people of Israel and then he would cover his face. And the New Testament makes it clear that the reason he was covering his face, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, is because the glory was fading. And the nation of Israel was not to see the fading glory in the face of Moses. So it was necessary for him to be in in, in and out of the tent. It was necessary for him to be in the presence of God in order for this glory of God to be manifested to him. And when he was not in there, then it would slowly fade. And so this relationship with God is something that has to be pursued. So how do you do it? How do you pursue? Ken Sandy, in an excellent article on the web um, at um, at whatever that address is there, something 360, 
um, says four things. Number one, cherish time with God. Cherish time with God. That's where it starts. By being in the Word of God very early on. He starts his article. Interesting. You, you should go and look it up. Just Google Ken Sandy. It'll come right up. Um, he, he starts the article by saying, my computer has a program on it. Every morning it updates the, the virus thing to protect my computer from all the viruses that are out there. How much more do I need to spend time in the Word of God every morning to protect me from the viruses of this world? And so he says, I've learned to spend time. And at first it was hard. At first I thought, I can't do this. I can't do this every day. And now I can't get enough of it. And so you start with that time with God. Early in the morning. Don't put it off until night. It doesn't happen. You start early in the morning. You want God to, to uh, affect your thinking in the de early in the morning before you get started and get going. Read life-changing books. Read books by Tozer. Read books by um, Sky Jathani that we talked about, by John Piper and by others. Read books that, that lift you up into the presence of God. That's important. Third, pursue quality relationships. The thing that will make you different a year from now than where you are today are the books that you read and the people that you hang with. And so you should hang with people that are going to lift you up, not tear you down. Evaluate your friendships and hang with people. Find godly people and spend time with them. And fourthly, enjoy regular worship. It's a great article, and it's a great advice for us. Once again, I want to close with a quote from Tozer. I think this is really telling. He says, faith may be exercised now. He's talking about in our in our uh, anemic Christian world, faith may be exercised without a jar to the moral life, without shaking up your moral life, or without embarrassment of the endemic ego, without embarrassing your old nature. Christ may be received without creating any special love for him in the soul of the receiver. We invite people to, invite, to accept Jesus as their Savior and be born again, and we tend to say that's all they need. The man is saved, but he is not hungry nor thirsty after God. In fact, he is specifically taught to be satisfied and is encouraged to be content with little in terms of what God has to offer, he's talking about. He adds this, The modern scientist has lost God amidst the wonders of his world. We Christians are in danger of losing God amidst the wonders of his word. Scientists are working in this world all around us. Amazing world that God created, and they lost God, right? The majority of them are not believers, and they're working with what God made, and which clearly reveals God, and yet they don't, they're clueless. And he says the same thing can happen to Christians who can be experts in the Word. He said, we, we have almost forgotten that God is a person, and as such, can be cultivated as any person can. It is inherent in personality to be able to know other personalities but the knowledge of one personality by another cannot be achieved in one encounter. It is only after long and loving mental intercourse that the full personalities of both can be explored. What he's saying is pursue God. Pursue a relationship with God. Talk with God. Spend time in his presence and in his word as you seek to honor him. I would say that pursuing God is a man's highest calling. God created us for that relationship. He walked with Adam and Eve in the garden until they sinned. And he desires to walk with you. And so that's our highest calling. Maintain regular forgiveness through confession of sin. Pursue God's presence and pursue God's glory. Because he pursued you. The Bible says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's you and me. Jesus came to give his life for us. And so these elements in front of us this morning represent the fact that Jesus made that sacrifice for us. 
he gave his body on the cross for you and me. And he died and shed his blood that you and I might have a relationship with God. It's kind of like a family adopting someone into their home and then making them live in the garage. If you don't pursue a relationship with this God who has redeemed us. Father, as we take these elements this morning, I pray that you would impress upon us through the personhood of Jesus, through this real person in a very real body who died a very real death for us, that you would impress upon us how much you love us and how much you want a very real relationship with us today. We're grateful for what Jesus has done. We're grateful for this bread, which represents his body. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.